Hey, pre-calc students, we are just about at the end of unit five here on rational functions. There's really one new piece left to do, and this is on page 26 in your packet. It's called reverse review. And reverse review just means how can we get the equation of something that's already sketched for us and uh, identify some of the key critical information that's already on the graph there. So we'll talk about, if you think about how we graph something and what we get from the top of the fraction, what we get from the bottom of the fraction, that does make it pretty easy to piece things together and be able to work backwards and get the equation that goes with the sketch over here. So let's start filling in some of the information that we know just by looking at the graph. Does it have any symmetry? Well, yeah, it actually has a lot of symmetry. I see that it's symmetric about the y-axis, the x-axis, and it even looks like it's symmetric about the origin. So we have x, y, and origin symmetry. So that should start meaning something to you in terms of what the equation is going to look like in the end. As far as asymptotes are concerned, we do have vertical asymptotes at 1, 2, 3, and negative 3. So we've got x equals plus or minus 3 if you want to just write those in a combined format. And it looks like we have horizontal asymptotes located at 1 and negative 1. So I'll write y equals plus or minus 1. For our intercepts, we're talking about x and y intercepts here. We definitely have x intercepts at positive and negative two, so I'll write those combined, plus or minus two, comma, zero. For the y-intercepts, zero, comma, well, I can see I have that positive and negative y-intercept, but I'm going to leave this blank for now. I'm not exactly sure where those are located. Are they at a half? Are they at a three-fourths? Are they at somewhere in between? You know, we're not maybe too sure yet, but I think we'll be able to confirm exactly where they are once we start building the equation over here. So are we going to write the equation? Well, if we think about the fraction that makes up these graphs. We know that the numerator comes from wherever the x-intercepts are located. So that's going to be x plus 2 times x minus 2. Those factors would produce roots at plus or minus 2. Think about what kind of information you get from the denominator. The denominator de uh, determines where the vertical asymptotes are. So that's going to be x plus 3 times x minus 3. Now, you have to do one or two things to finish this up. It's certainly not an equation yet because it's not equal to anything. But what am I going to set it equal to such that we would have not only x, not only y, but origin symmetry, all three of those symmetries to make that happen? Because specifically we have x-axis symmetry, actually, this is a y-squared equation. So this is probably the easiest way of writing the equation. y squared equals x plus 2 times x minus 2 over x plus 3 times x minus 3. And that actually fits to have all of the key features of this, this sketch that's over here. This equation would make all of that true. Because think about the equal heaviness we have here for the Lie coefficients. If you were to multiply this out, in fact, what would that be? x squared minus 4 on top and then x squared minus 9 on the bottom. Because of the equal heaviness there, it would be 1 over 1 and technically plus or minus the square root of that, which is still 1. So it matches where we have our um, asymptotes that are horizontal. Another way of writing this, by the way, is if you don't like y squared, you can leave it y, but then you need plus or minus the square root of all of that. So it can be some combination, actually, of these two things. If you like the plus or minus square root with the factored form underneath, go for it. If you like y squared with the multiplied out version up here, you can kind of interchange these then. You know, you have some options in terms of how you write the equation. You don't have to write both, but either or would work in terms of writing the equation here. Now think about the y-intercepts for a second, though. We weren't too sure about them. Like, are they at a half? Are they at a little close, closer to three quarters? We're not sure. But if I plug in zero for x in this equation, I get negative four over negative nine, which is four ninths. And the square root of four-ninths is two-thirds. In fact, it's plus or minus two-thirds. So that's where the y-intercepts are, zero, and then plus or minus two-thirds. Cross off that question mark. We no longer do no, um, need that there. We've got the y-intercepts at plus or minus two-thirds. So just as a quick note, you might want to hold off sometimes on y-intercepts until you've maybe written the equation up here. We should be able to do domain pretty quickly based on the graph. I'm going negative infinity up till first vertical at negative 3. Then notice how there's nothing sketched in between negative 3 and negative 2. That would be one of those like restricted regions. But everything from negative 2 to 2 is included with brackets. 
right? Because you have closed circles at these endpoints. Nothing from two to three, but then the rest of the graph is from three to infinity. So domain is pretty easy to answer whether or not you came up with this equation or not. You're just looking at the graph and seeing where the X values exist. Let's do a similar one right below it. If you want to challenge yourself because you think you've got it at this point, go for it. Hit pause and then check back in with me in a moment. Let's talk about types of symmetry first for this one. So symmetry, does it have X, Y, and origin just like the last one? Oh, not quite. It's not symmetric about the Y axis. It's not symmetric about the origin, but it is symmetric about the X axis. Whenever something's symmetric about the X axis, we know it's a Y squared equation. So let's see if we can fill in some of the other missing pieces. The asymptotes. Looks like we have an asymptote at negative four and then another asymptote over here at positive four. So I'm gonna write X equals plus or minus four. Looks like the horizontal asymptotes are in the same place they were before. Y equals plus or minus one. We have some intercepts. The intercepts are at negative three, zero. We also have an intercept at the origin at zero, zero. That zero, zero, keep in mind that counts as an x-intercept and also a y-intercept. So we already know the y-intercept in this one. If you want to even fill in domain at this point before writing the equation, of course we can do that. Negative infinity up to the first vertical at negative four. Union, then the next x in takes us from negative three to zero. You can use brackets there. And then jump all the way to this section of the graph from four to infinity is the last region. Okay, so nothing in here, nothing in this little region over here. Okay, how do we write the equation? Thinking back to what I did up here a moment ago, we're thinking about numerator where the x-intercepts are. So if the x-intercepts are at negative three and zero, x plus three is the factor that gives you a root at negative three. How do I get a root at zero or an x at zero? How about just x? I mean, I guess if you were x minus zero, that would be okay, but a factor of x up top is gonna to give you that other x intercept. And we know the vertical asymptotes are what give you the denominator. So that's gonna be x plus four times x minus four. And to be honest, I like leaving it in the factored form. You'll, you'll typically see me do that. If you really love multiplying uh, polynomials, then go for it, multiply them together and, and get an alternate form. But remember, it's either this with y squared or y equals plus or minus the square root. If you're gonna go this route, you gotta remember that plus or minus out front. Because if you don't put the plus or minus out front, you would only get one half of this graph, not the whole thing with both pieces. Okay. So next time to work together in class, I'm going to show you the solution to this one. So I am going to encourage you to try this one right here on page 27. But this one down here, if you're a little scared of it because it looks different, then we'll do this together. So it's up to you if you want to try it. If you're up for the challenge, go for it. But we're going to, this will be done together in class next time I see you. This one, I'm just going to throw up an answer and say, like, here it is. Let me know if you have questions. But this one, I'll actually talk about as we go through it together. Okay, I'm actually going to have you flip back in the packet, and everything from here on out is purely review. There is nothing else that is new in this unit. That was really the last thing. If you turn to page, going backwards, page 19, this is start of some practice with just sketching. And it's a packet about rational or irrational um, equations and their sketches. We'll go through this front page next time I see you in class, but if you turn to page 20, I'm going to do number one with you right now. At this point, if you wanted to try any of these on your own and then check back with the video, please feel free to do that. Okay, This is all review. There is nothing new that I'm about to go over. I'm, I'm choosing tougher ones to go over, to be honest, but if you want to give it a shot on your own, go for it. When you have y squared in the equation, what we just saw is that that's the same thing as plus or minus the square root of x times four minus x over x plus one times three minus x. So I want you to be thinking about that because when we get to the case where we start talking about you know, asymptotes and intercepts, specifically things that relate to y, we have to consider it's plus or minus the square root of whatever's going on underneath that radical there. So let's get our list off to the side here. We need some vertical asymptotes. That's going to be at x equals negative 1 and at x equals positive 3, according to what makes the denominator equal 0. Okay. We will have horizontal asymptotes, plural. You're going to get negative x squared if you multiply out the top and negative x squared if you multiply out the bottom. 
So the lead coefficients would divide out to negative one over negative one, which is positive one. But what students forget all the time is it's not just one, it's plus or minus the square root of one. Those are where the horizontal asymptotes would be. Well, of course, the square root of one is just one still, but you have to have two horizontal asymptotes at plus or minus one. For x-intercepts, we have two of them. One of them is at zero, because that factor of x like we just saw a minute ago. And then the other one would be at four, zero. If you have an x-intercept at zero, that has to be your y-intercept as well. But if you plug in zero for all the x's, you'll get zero over, um, what would this be down here? Three times one, which is three. Well, zero over three is still zero. And plus or minus the square root of zero is zero. So we have the key information that we need to make our sketch. In the end, it's probably useful to think in advance that this will have x-axis symmetry because it has a y squared in the equation. Y squared guaranteed to have x-axis symmetry. So let's go ahead and draw some axes here. Okay, start graphing some of those asymptotes. So we got one at negative one over here. X equals three. Y equals plus or minus one. And we can plot our intercepts. So one at zero, zero, one at four, zero. And I think that's it. We're ready to start partitioning. So when I do the partitioning, we got to put all those special X values down below here, which would include negative one, zero, three, and four. Okay. So if you test something to the left of negative one, we've done this so many times, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with it, but if you test like negative two, you're gonna get negative positive or minus negative two is a positive number, right? So it'd be negative positive over the bottom would also be negative positive. So the top is negative, the bottom's negative, but altogether when I divide those negatives, you get positive. And just to save us some time, you don't need to see me do the partitioning for all of these. You will find that the signs will wind up alternating, which happens a lot. Don't ever operate under that assumption on the test, but certainly we're okay in this case to say the signs alternate. Okay, now remember, when you're doing irrational equations, this is irrational, by the way. Why is it irrational? It has a big radical over it. Anything with a radical is irrational. Didn't start that way, but to get y alone, you have to take the square root of both sides. When you have something that's irrational, negative means that you're taking the square root of a negative number, which is not a real value. So in between negative one and zero, you will see nothing at all graphed. You can cross that whole section off. And in between three and four, same thing. Wherever you get a negative value on the number line, that means you're taking the square root of a negative, which is no good. So nothing at all sketched in these little tiny regions here. But what am I gonna see graphed when I'm to the left of negative one? Well, positive just means that you're gonna get a graph that approaches infinity as you get close to the vertical. But as I go to the left forever, it's gonna curve towards the horizontal. So you're gonna get a graph that looks something like this. Now, because this has x-axis symmetry, not only do we get all these positive y values, but we get the same corresponding negative y values right below. So you have to flip that over the x-axis and also approach negative infinity as you get close to that vertical asymptote. That plus or minus out front is what's doing this. It's the positive radical graph and it's also the negative radical. Flip it over the x-axis. What happens in between zero and three? Well, as I move from zero to three, I'm getting close to a vertical asymptote. What does a graph do when it gets close to a vertical? It goes up to infinity. Notice I had to cross the horizontal to do that, but we've done it many times before, so we shouldn't be scared anymore. And then you gotta flip it over the x-axis. We see this part as well. So this one's looking pretty weird, okay? We have this little split thing happening here. And in the last section, the last section, what's happening is we're positive to the right of four, but the graph is not going to do that same repeated split like we saw over here. We're not approaching a vertical asymptote as we go to the right. What am I approaching? I'm approaching a horizontal asymptote. So as we go to the right forever, the graph wants to go close to y equals one and then flip it over also to y equals negative one. So kind of a weird-ish looking sketch in the end. I'm not sure we've done one that's looked like this so far, but putting all the components together and knowing what we know about the behavior as we approach verticals versus going towards horizontals, 
this is what the sketch looks like for number one. Okay. I think you're going to have a great time. I hope at least finding this key information, but thinking about the symmetry specifically really does help to shape what the graph looks like. All right. So as a reminder, this one was irrational because of the radical that you get when you take the square to both sides. We're going to do one right now that's rational. Let's do number four. And this is the last one that I'll do with you. It's rational because there's no radical over the top. And in addition, it's not y squared equals. So I wouldn't have to take the square to both sides to really truly consider what the graph would look like. The nice thing about this is that it's in factored form, which is good news. The maybe tricky part about it is that we have common factors of x plus 4. So when I cancel those x plus 4s, I hope you're thinking right off the bat, oh yeah, there's a hole at x equals negative 4. And to find the y value of the hole, you're going to plug in negative 4 for x here and here, and then down there as well. So when I plug in negative 4 for x there, the top is going to become negative 13 times negative 6, which I think is... 78. Is that right? Yeah, 78. And the bottom would be negative 4 minus 3, which is negative 7. So the whole is at negative 4. And then it's going to be negative 78 sevenths, which is not my favorite y value in the world. But just to get what that is as a decimal, it's about 11.14. Okay, so this is about a negative 11.14 as a y value. So I'll try and use that when I go to make my sketch and approximate where that's located. Thinking about the other key information, now that I've crossed this off, you're essentially graphing what's left. So when I think about vertical asymptotes, it's a vertical asymptote at x equals 3. When I move on to horizontal or slant, we have slant asymptotes to consider as well. Because this is going to be top heavy, right? If you multiply the top out, which I actually need, it would be 3x squared. You're going to get a minus 6x and a minus 1x, so minus 7x would go in the middle, plus 2 over x minus 3. Because I can see it's top heavy, it's x squared over x to the first, we know there's no horizontal asymptote. It's going to be a slant asymptote. So to find the slant asymptote, we're going to use synthetic division. Dividing by x minus 3 means we're testing 3 as a root. Coefficients are 3, negative 7, and 2. Bring down the 3. 3 times 3 is 9, plus negative 7 is 2. 2 times 3 is 6, plus 2 is 8. Remember to ignore the remainder with doing the synthetic division. The equation that you're left with is a linear equation, right? We divided a linear into a quadratic, so that's linear that's left. It's the equation y equals 3x plus 2. So as we go to infinity or negative infinity along the x-axis, the graph is going to head towards this line, y equals 3x plus 2. Okay, once we've gotten that, let's do the x -ins. The x -ins, let's go back to the factored form. So it has x-intercepts at 2, and this would be 1 third if you set that to 0. So 1 third and positive 2. And you're going to have a y-intercept at, if you plug in 0 for all the x's in this format, you get negative 2 thirds. And I think that's everything that we need. We, we know we have the hole in the graph. We know we have our vertical and slant asymptotes. We've got the intercepts. So let's go ahead and start making a sketch here. Okay. So if I plot the vertical asymptote at x equals 3, we need our slant asymptote at 3x plus 2. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to um, y equals 2 for your y-intercept and then use the slope of up 3, 1, 2, 3, over 1. Or you can go down 3 and to the left 1. And you can now see the slope of that line. Since it's an asymptote, you're going to sketch it as a dotted line. Okay. So here's the deal. You really need to see where those asymptotes intersect up here, the vertical and then the slants. Because, spoiler alert, there's going to be a graph that lives up here. So sorry that the grid, I probably could have scaled it a little bit better so that we can fit that. But we're actually going to graph something up there in just a little bit. Okay. All right. So let's do the partitioning. And I've really run out of space for the partitioning, haven't I? But what would I have to partition around? I'd have to partition around just the vertical asymptote and the two x-intercepts. So that's going to be at one-third, two, and then three. I haven't even plotted those intercepts yet. So we got one third x equals two. 
And then the y-intercept was at zero comma negative two thirds, which would be down here. Okay. So if you do the partitioning, again, just to really save time here, it's gonna be negative, positive, negative, positive. Okay. So once we've got all that taken care of, how do we make the graph? Well, don't forget, by the way, that we have this hole that we're supposed to include on the graph. At x equals negative four, I'm supposed to go down just a little bit more than 11 to plot the hole. I think that's gonna go off the grid on mine. So I'm just gonna put the hole way down here. Just knowing that that's at x equals negative four comma negative 11.14. Sorry, I've really messed up the scaling on this one, haven't I? Well, I didn't really mess up, but I could have chosen a better scale to fit all this in here. All right, so we're negative to the left of a third. That makes sense, because we have a negative y-intercept, a negative y-value for the hole. So the graph's gonna head towards that slant, right? As you go to the left forever, the graph's gonna head towards that slanted line. And then it goes positive just for a little while between the roots. So we come above the x-axis just for a short period of time. But between two and three, you then turn negative again. So it's got to head back towards the vertical asymptote here. Finally, to the right of three, when I'm positive, what does the graph look like? Well, remember, when you get close to a vertical and you're positive, it's going to go up to infinity. But then as I go to the right, what does the graph want to do? It wants to curve towards the slant. So this one was a tough fit in here, but in the end, if you have all these key pieces, that's what the graph looks like when, when pieced all together there, okay? So if you have any questions about this one, check in with me next time we're in class together. We'll have a little bit more review time before we take a test. But otherwise, all of the rest of this packet is just sketching practice. So do as much as you need to to prepare yourself for a rational and irrational unit test. Have a great rest of your day. I'll check in with you soon.